AP, um, after being asked by one of your classmates to go ahead and do these videos, and she asked me very kindly and in a way that made me actually feel good about making these videos, I decided to go ahead and re uh, at least do videos for Act 3. I don't know how many it's going to take. Uh, Act 3 is kind of short uh, compared to the other two, so I may be able to knock this down in two videos. It just depends. Um, but hopefully these will be helpful. If they're not, then I hope it helps that one student who told me they were helping her. And, uh, you know, as long as one person's getting something out of it, I don't mind uh, doing it. So uh, so let's pick up with Act 3. Um, I'm not sure what page it is for you guys. I'm using my book because uh, it's got my notes in it, and it's going to be a lot easier. So we start out as the Act 3 begins, and we have Rosencrantz and Guildenstern on the boat with Hamlet, that scene where they're going to England, and they're carrying the letter that is to condemn, condemn Hamlet to his death. All right? So that's where we pick up. Um, a lot of back and forth, again, you see the really short back and forth stuff. Like I said, a lot of the, the space in this play is dead space because there's a lot of that. So it, it, it feels a lot longer than it is. Um, so they're really just kind of dealing with the are we really here type moment. And this is this is a, you know common with this a type of existential writing where, you know, do we really exist? Are we really here? It's like that really crazy type of thinking. And they're trying to, again, make sense of their existence is really what this is about because they feel like they're pawns in someone else's game. Do they really exist? Are they, you know, just here to be used by others? Do they have a real purpose themselves or are they just playing pieces? That sort of thing. So kind of a, uh, they don't really say it. Like I said, it's just this whole, like, pinch me, am I here? That sort of thing, okay? So um, I'm kind of reading this as I go through. I did some research ahead of time so I know what's going on, but I'm looking for certain lines. Okay, let's see. I got my highlights here. Um, so Gildenstern and Rosencrantz are talking. Gildenstern says, I thought you, and then he stops. I've lost all capacity for disbelief. I'm not sure that I could even rise to a little gentle skepticism. So we just see he's getting tired of all of this. You know, Gildenstern's really struggling with, life, the concept of death, um, you know, what role he plays, if he even matters. I mean, these are not unheard of discussions to get into for anyone. You got to think, this is kind of thing that we still struggle with all the time. If you haven't asked yourself those questions, you will at some point. Um, not Maybe not at all the same time, like poor Rose, or Gildenstern. Rosencrantz doesn't ask himself any questions. But like poor Gildenstern having this whole, when you talk about the terms, if you've ever heard this, an existential crisis, that is what this is. And that term existential comes from this type of writing, all right, or that kind of philosophy, really. It's not just writing. But in this idea that, again, struggling with your place, your purpose, um, if your existence even matters, that sort of thing. And that's what we're really dealing with. Um, Rosencrantz says, well, shall we stretch our legs? Gildan says, I don't feel like stretching my legs. And Rosencrantz says, I'll stretch them for you if you like. Now, again, notice the, the humor because Rosencrantz is a very literal person. We talked about the value of language and how paying attention to you know what people say. A lot of the times there's misunderstandings because we have literal meanings and we have figurative meanings and we have tone and everything else that can confuse that. So, and of course, it's also there for the humor. This, these are these plays are meant to be funny. They're still tragedies. I want you to understand. But in tragedy doesn't mean everything's sad. It just means that um, building up to uh, the ending, your your main characters are worse off in a tragedy. It doesn't mean humor doesn't play a part of it. And that's part of the theater of the absurd too. You take a tragedy and you take a very sad story, the story of Rosencrantz and Guildenstern, and then you turn it into this kind of humorous, you know discussion so it kind of fits all right um so they're talking about the boat he says uh we could stretch each other's this is rosencrantz by the way that way we wouldn't have to go anywhere and gildenstern pauses and he says no somebody might come in and rosencrantz says in where well out here in out here on deck so they realize they're kind of on a boat think about what a boat does Okay, so on the literal level, a boat really ha hampers your movement. Um, you know, there's only so far you can go either way, and then you've got open ocean. And there's a lot of other things on the boat that make movement and doing much, especially on boats in this time period, very limited. So it, again, helps to symbolize their lives and how limited they are uh, and how they feel like they're trapped on this boat. They can't really go anywhere, which matches their lives as they also don't feel like they can go anywhere. Guys, excuse me, I've got to have to wear my glasses Getting old is just miserable, let me tell you. All right, so we'll look a little bit more professional, I guess, since I decided to wear a T-shirt in this video instead of a dress shirt. Um, it's 10 o'clock on Sunday night. <laughs> so I'm, just, I'm about beat. Um, 
So Gildenstern says, yes, I'm very fond of boats myself. I like the way they're contained. And he has a dash before that because there's this pause where he's like, you know, it feels like everything's right here. You don't have to worry about which way to go or whether to go at all. The question doesn't arise because you're on a boat, aren't you? Boats are safe areas in the game of tag. The players will hold their positions until the music starts. I think I'll spend most of my life on boats. Okay. And of course, you know, the irony here is he's going to spend almost the rest of his life on a boat because not because he's got a long life that's going to be filled with boating adventures because his life is nearly at its end. Uh, the little bit of time he's going to have off a boat is just to hand that letter to the king of England and then to have himself beheaded. So um, Gildenstern points out that one is free on a boat for a time relatively. And again, it's this idea that you're the entire world that is, is available to you right then, uh, figuratively, of course, because, you know, everything, everyone around you is all on this one contained thing. It would be like putting, you know, everyone in one room. And, you know, we, we have a lot more freedom, even though we're in a smaller area, because we know the entire situation, because we know who all's in here. We know what's going on. And it just gives you some modicum of control, which is what he's struggling with a lot right now. Um, continuing on a little farther, we've still got another kind of, kind of, we're only a few lines down, by the way, if you're following along. Gildenstern is still talking about boats, all right? There's a lot of discussion about boats here. He says, free to move, speak, extemporize, and yet we have not been cut loose. Our truancy is defined by one fixed star, and our drift represents merely a slight change of angle to it. We may seize the moment, toss it around while the moments pass, a short dash here, an exploration there, but we are brought round full circle to face again that single immutable fact that we, Rosencrantz and Gildenstern, bearing a letter from one king to another, are taking Hamlet to England. Now, bonus for those of you watching the videos, one of your questions was about a, a line in here, and it's a hard line, and I'm going to tell you what it means, and that's what your job was on the questions. So here you go, the answer to a question. The line is, our truancy is defined by one fixed star, and our drift represents merely a slight change of angle to it. This, the literal thing here is he's like, you know, our, the time, you know, we're, we're arriving is based on an angle to a star. He's like, you know, truancy is defined basically by we're, our angle to the star is not where it should be. It's a little bit past that. Basically dealing with the concept of time. Um, but it also deals with perspective, all right? The idea that, you know, uh, so much of our life is based on, you know, this this one, this big defining point, whatever that is for you, and success or failure or anything else is defined by your angle towards that pillar that you've set up. So um, think about for some people, success depends on their bank account and the amount of money in it. And unless you reach a certain point to them, that pillar they've set up is that financial security. And unless they reach that point, well, they don't feel like they're a success. Um, maybe it's for family. Maybe it's to get married at a certain age and have two or three kids by a certain age. Um, once you've had those kids, maybe it's those kids' successes and to be able to define yourself by that so that you feel like a good parent, regardless of what it is. Um, our, you know, our definitions are going to define uh, our, our angle towards that star is going to define how uh, we're late or whether we're on time. Um, it's kind of an interesting statement. He's pointing to how uh, relative the concept of time really is, because, you know, while, yes, you're, you're it's based on positions of stars. If you're you know trying to tell time in this ancient, not ancient, but this older time period. But, you know, honestly, you know, it, it's still a man-made creation in a lot of ways. You know, the concept of two o'clock is not something that is, uh, you know, set in stone. It's something we've decided by because of the angle of the sun and that sort of thing. So he's also saying that not only is that ambiguous and that a very relative thing, but so is our con. Now, this is a, this is ex building on it, okay? But the idea here is that also um, our success and failures are also very um, relative to the situation and what you define as success. But, you know, of course, he says the fact is, is that in some ways we have no say-so in defining that point. And that's when he gets to the whole, we are Rosencrantz and Gildenstern, and this is what we're doing, and this is the one point. And so basically our success or failure is going to depend on this one detail. So, you know, again, this is a favorite of the existentialist to kind of converse with, you know, what's right and what's wrong and how do we define things. And, and really, it, it's a, a deep, deep philosophy that really requires you to do a lot of thinking. It's very confusing, to be honest with you, but, uh, you know, that's, that's, something should be difficult, right? All right, so uh, so they notice they're talking about Hamlet. Um, I think it's Hamlet they find in the barrel. 
Sorry, let me go back and look. It's about which time Rosecrans has returned, tiptoeing with gray and port, teeth clenched for secrecy, gets to Gillenstern points surreptitiously behind him in a tight whisper. I say he's there. What's he doing? Sleeping. Yeah, they're talking about Hamlet here. Um, and, you know, again, they feel trapped. They feel like we're, we were told we had to take this letter with Ham for Hamlet, and that's it. Um, Gildenstern gets, starts getting upset here. It says he cries out, all I ask for is, is our common due. Uh, and Rosencrantz says, for those in peril on the sea, and then Gildenstern says, give us to stay our daily cue. Now, really cool line. This is another one I asked you about, by the way. Gildenstern's upset. He says, all I want is what is owed to a basic human being. You know, the freedom to make some of your own choices, the freedom to pursue your own wants and desires. And he feels like he's being robbed of that because he's being pushed around by other people and he's upset. And that is not unheard of. I mean, think about how most of your life as a teenager has been spent to this point. You've had very little real control over it. Uh, you're starting to get to a point where you're going to have more and you're going to have some of that freedom. But when you really start to step outside of that and look at the big picture, you realize you still don't have as much freedom as you think you do. All right. If you're going to be a productive member of our society, there's certain things you have to do. For example, and I know this is a stretch for an AP class, but I'm going to throw this out there. Um, there's 11 of you in this class. And from talking to you, I think you all, you know, are, are very much so and have been for a while set on the idea of college. But if you were to go to the honors class and the, and the CP class, you're going to see kids who are going to college because it's what society says they have to do to be successful. It's not something they want to do. And, that, and if, honestly, if they could get away with not going, I think a lot of them wouldn't. I mean, honestly, there may be some of you in here who feel the same way. I mean, if you're a smart person, college is what you do, right? So even if your desire is to do something that may not have been included in college, maybe you want to be a musician. You don't need to go to college to be a musician. If you're good, you can be good at the age of 18, just like you can be at 48. So, I mean, there's a lot of things, but we feel like society dictates this is what we should do. And by the way, Mr. Morse is not telling you not to go to college. I'm just telling you that this is the situation. If we take what uh, Rosencrantz and Gildenstern are singing, we put it in our time today. That's the similarity, all right? So he's upset, and then he says a really fame, a cool line. Now, I haven't pointed out all of them, but throughout this play, if you've been reading, you see this, give us this day our daily blank, and they change that last word. Of course, it's a play on the uh, give us this day our daily bread from the Lord's Prayer, but um, they'll insert other words, and that's kind of important. This time he says, give us this day our daily cue, and cue here is like a cue card or getting a cue on stage. It's basically like when you forget a line, someone might give you the first few words to get you going. That's a cue or a cue card. If you can't remember stuff, somebody holds it up and it has the words on it. In other words, he needs, he feels like he needs direction. Um, you know, he's griping about not having freedom, yet he still wants his direction. And guys, we can say that's paradoxical, but that's how we are. You know, you guys want to be have the freedom to pursue whatever you want, but you're going to get to college and then you're going to want someone to tell you, well, what should I do? I mean, we, we talk about wanting freedom, but we really don't. Um, you know, we want to be able to do what we want to do when we want to do it. But when it comes to big decisions, it's hard for us to make them. It's why so many people don't. It's why you have so many people in careers that they don't want to be in because they just couldn't make up a decision and no one told them. You know, for the longest time, you've had parents say, you're going to be in an AP class or you're going to be in honors. But if you take that away, and it's just like, hey, whatever you want to do, at that point, you find yourself kind of like, I don't really know what I want to do, to be honest with you. And that's kind of where Gildenstern and Rosencrantz are right now. Um, Gildenstern still going on some really great lines here. He says, we act on scraps of information, sifting half-remembered directions that we can hardly separate from instinct. He's like, we're given these directions, but they're not the full picture. It's just pieces of things. He said, and it's, we're going through like pieces of that. It's it's you don't really get to see what's going to happen. You just get, you know, hey, this is I want you to go to this place. And you're like, what do I do when I get there? Don't worry about that. Just go. Well, none of us are going to be happy with directions like that. So Gildenstern is really upset because, again, he feels like he has no control. Guys, I'm going to tell you, when you get down to the bottom of it, this play is about that, in my opinion. Rosencrantz and Gildenstern in the play Hamlet had no control over their situation. Everything they did backfired. They were being pushed around by stronger people the king, the queen, and Hamlet particularly. And now we see in this play, we get to see a little bit more of their view of this. And they, that we still see that happening though. They're still being pushed and not having any real control and not getting to do what they want to do or what they feel is right. And that's going to be kind of echoed here in just a minute when they, if you'll remember in Hamlet, eventually they, they see what the letter, or Hamlet at least sees what the letter says and then he switches it. There's going to be another wrinkle, a little twist to that in this play, all right? Um, 
so uh, Rosencrantz starts wanting to play the coin game again, but you know that's got that's a continuing motif in this play. Um, trying to see where we get to the latter. Um, he talks about the king. Gildenstern talks about the king not being able to discriminate between the two of them, which we talked about that being very common. Um, of course, I think I, I'm not positive on this, and I'm not I'm not studying as closely as I should be right now. But I think that this is again another one of those verbal irony points where they're talking about how much money the king gave each of them. And Gildenstern says he wouldn't discriminate between us. In other words, he wouldn't, you know, uh, give me more than you. You know, this is discrimination, like with racial discrimination, that definition. But discriminate also means being able to tell the difference. He said he wouldn't be able to discriminate. In other words, he does, this is, he wouldn't give, treat us differently. And yet he's also pointing out that he can't tell the difference in them. It's a really cool um, way to use verbal irony. But one of the things that sucks about our language is this uh, how often word of oh, the same word can have very different meanings and it can cause chaos for foreign speakers and it also can cause chaos for even native speakers so like when we're seeing this i think the two characters are meaning something different again we see that all the time in this play all right um rosencrantz says he wouldn't discriminate between us and gildenstern says even if he could Rosencrantz, which he never could, Gildenstern, he couldn't even be sure of mixing us up without mixing us up. That's Rosencrantz. Um, so, and Gildenstern gets mad at Rosencrantz at this point. He says, you just repeat it in a different order, all the things that were said. The fact is, is that once again, Rosencrantz and Gildenstern both both kind of represent these two different ways of looking at life. And we are all at some point in our life, a Rosencrantz or a Gildenstern. Rosencrantz is the one who's just going through the motions and doing what he's supposed to, just repeating what's been said. Think about how often we do that. Think about how many of your beliefs and your ideas are really just you repeating what someone else has said. They're not really things that you've thought through or defined for yourself, but they're things that you've, you know, somebody you respect believed it. So here we go. This is what I'm going to go with. And that's fine for, you know, a while. But at some point, there's also the other side, the Gildenstern part of us that is the deep thinker who questions everything. And, you know, that's that's OK. I mean, we, we have this idea that to question things makes you a bad person and it doesn't, uh, whether it's political beliefs or religious beliefs, anything. Questioning is not a bad thing. It makes us smarter people and understanding why we believe what we believe is never a bad thing. So, you know, this this is two different coins of us. It's two different sides of a coin. Um, that is still us. Notice the concept of the coin again shows up. I mean, there's so many layers to this play. All right. Um, they kind of talk a little bit in Rosencrantz says, we've got nothing to go on. We're out on our own. And, uh, you know, we, again, there's this idea that they're being pushed around yet. They have no direction, which seems paradoxical, but um, it makes sense when you think about it. That's what a paradox does. Gildenstern points out, we're on our way to England. We're taking Hamlet there. And Rosencrantz says, what for? So at this point, they're trying to sit down and make sense of what's going on. They reference the letter at this point. Um, and they're like, well, the letter is the reason we're on this trip. We take Hamlet to England. We deliver the letter. And then Rosencrantz says, and, you know, basically, what's next? And then Gildenstern says, then that's it. We're finished. And of course, the irony there is he means they're finished with the job, but we know they're going to be Put to death at this point. So again, um, some definite dramatic irony developed in that statement. All right, we're about at 18 minutes. We'll see how much further I go before I may I may stop and do a second video. All right. Uh, in fact, I know we're going to. Let's get through the letter. Um, so they're basically going to go back and forth here, and you can read this. I'm not going to read every part. Uh, but Rosencrantz and Gildenstern are going back and forth and deciding basically whether that they, they, their problems, their lack of direction, can be solved by looking at this letter and seeing what's in it. And then that should help them understand the situation a little better. And of course, that, if I remember right, that does not happen in Hamlet. They don't, well, yeah, I'm pretty sure it doesn't. They don't look at the letter. They don't know what's in it. Hamlet does, but they don't. Now, they're going to read it, though, in this play. And think about the conundrum that puts them in. You've got this letter that the king and queen trusted you with that you have to deliver. This is a royal command. So if you don't, your life is forfeit. Now, but they also realize that if they go through with it, their best friend's going to be put to death. And remember, they actually do like Hamlet. This isn't like, you know, Hamlet's under the impression that they're just the pawns of the king and the queen and that they don't really care about him. But while he is right about them being pawns, it's because they don't have a choice. This is the problem with authority in some ways. If you're in a position where you do what I say or you're going to be put to death or you're going to lose your job or whatever else, you don't really have the freedom you think you do. I mean, you can make a stand and say, I refuse to do that. But you have to deal with the consequences. And they're like in a situation where we either 
do what the king and queen say and our best friend dies, or we ignore it and we die. I mean, this is a definite lose-lose, all right? Um, there's a little bit of slapstick humor about them figuring out who's got the letter. Again, great to see on stage, not so great to read, probably. Um, so, let's see. Um, one of my favorite phrases, not lines, is here. I actually um, always told my students a while back, when I, the last time I taught this, I swore that this was going to be, one of these days I was going to get back into music and I was going to have a band. And the name of my band is from this play, and I would be interested to see who all could get it. If they, I always loved bands that did that. Um, Y'all may not know it, but I don't really like this band, but you know, 21 Pilots is a title taken from a work of literature. Well, great line here. He's talking about England. He says it's just a conspiracy of cartographers, you mean. Conspiracy, conspiracy of cartographers, terrific name for a band. Y'all can't steal it. It's mine, all right? Um, so at this point, uh, they're, they're just debating what they're going to do, okay? Um, let me get to where – let me see. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Here we go. Let's do a couple more pages in my book anyway, and then we're going to stop, okay? And then I'll, I'll shoot the second video. Uh, Rosencrantz points out, we drift down time clutching at straws, but what good's a brick to a drowning man? I mean, that's a, there's a lot you can unpack there. Again, he's pointing out, you know, the concept of, uh, you know, the, the usefulness of resources in certain situations here. Um, and Gillen Stern says, don't give up. We can't be long now. And Rosencrantz says, we might as well be dead. Do you think death could possibly be a boat? And again, the discussion of death always points to, you know, we have some knowledge they don't. We know that they're on their way to their death. Gillen Stern says, no, no, no. Death is not. Death isn't. You take my meaning, death is the ultimate negative, not being. You can't not be on a boat. Uh, and Rosencrantz says, I've frequently not been on boats. And Rosencrantz says, I wish I was dead. And then it says he considers the drop, and he's thinking, looking over the edge of the boat. Uh, he says, that would put a spoke in their wheel. And this is, and again, this is a really dark statement, okay, guys? I'm just explaining to you what he's talking about. And there is truth to his statement. But the idea here he he's going through is, the one control that he has fully is over his own life. And he's like, if I feel like everything's out of control and I can't take control of my life, the one thing I know I can do is end it. And uh, I'm not going to you know, say that's a great way to think, but there's logic to it. And I think a lot of people who become suicidal, that's you can look at that as one of the reasons. Is the idea that I feel like I have no control, so I'm going to finally take control of the one thing I have that is mine 100%, and that is my life. So he makes that comment. He's basically saying, if I was to jump overboard, wouldn't that screw up their plans? And, uh, you know, yeah, <laughs> I guess cut off your nose to spite your face, it would work. Uh, and then, of course, Gil Rosencrantz says that, not Gildenstern, I'm sorry. Gildenstern points out, unless they're counting on it. And there's the, like, real twist of this. And the idea is he's like, yeah, I mean, you, you might put, a, put a, as he says, a spoke in their wheel. If you jump overboard, but what if that's what was supposed to happen and you've just done what they said? At that point, staying alive would be the best way to buck fate. And again, the, the content, concept in most of Shakespeare's tragedies particularly is do we how much control do we have in our life? Well, Tom Stoppard's just carried that over in this play. Um, he's just harping on it even more, the fact that you know we can't know. You know, if you just, it, It's this free will versus fate debate all over again. Do you – when you do something, have you got – was that – your choice or was that what was supposed to happen can you stop what was supposed to happen you know if i was it's like those final destination movies can you actually cheat death and what happens if you do well is it going to keep coming after me till it gets me or you know is everything just this uh you know big mismatch of coincidences now remember theater of the absurd that these writers are often atheists okay i'm not, I'm not gonna like defend them here um but and i'm not gonna apologize for teaching it. I'm not teaching atheism. I'm teaching this concept here. You got to think it's easy for us as Christians to kind of answer this fate versus free will questions. And we still struggle with it. Different denominations have different opinions, but you know, we have the idea that, you know, there's this, um, higher power, God looking out for us and that things are, there is this level of, we don't call it fate. We would call it providence where it's God's plan for certain things to happen, yet we most of us would agree we still have to walk through those steps. And, of course, then the question comes, can you go against God's plan? And then, there, then there's where the debate comes up. Now, if you take God out of that equation, to where a lot of atheists would approach this from, this becomes an even muddier subject. And that's one of the things with existential writers that comes to, you know, do, I, do my actions matter? Do they have a purpose? Or is this just 
I'm part of a play that I have no control over. If I do have control over it, how much responsibility do I have? There's so many questions that come up again if you take God out of the equation, which is one of the reasons why I'm really glad that that's not an issue for me. Um, going on, he says, uh, I shall remain on board. This is Rosencrantz. He says, that'll put a spoke in their wheels. All right, we don't question, we don't doubt, we perform. But a line must be drawn somewhere, and I would like to put it on record that I have no confidence in England, thank you. And even if it is true, it'll just be another shambles. So he says, okay, well, I'll trick them. I'll stay on board if they want me to jump. You know, typical Rosencrantz passage. Um, so, and then Gildenstern and him are still fighting. Gildenstern points out on the next page, he says, well, we're nobody special. And that's kind of the thing with Rosencrantz and Gildenstern. They're not. But when we look at ourselves, each of us, we're not in a lot of ways, not you know, globally special, maybe not even nationally, maybe not even locally special, but that doesn't mean we don't have value, all right? But Rosencrantz and Gildenstern are feeling very devalued at this point. Like, you know, our purpose is what, to carry a letter across on a boat? We're mail carriers at this point. Um, and our life is dependent on this. Um, okay, so I'm trying to remember if this is the discussion about death that's so cool. It's not. It's coming, and it'll be in the next video, but there's still kind of an interesting part here. Um, Gildenstern points out, what is so terrible about death? As Socrates so philosophically put it, since we don't know what death is, it's illogical to fear it. It might be very nice. Certainly it is a release from the burden of life and for the godly a haven and a reward. Or to look at it another way, we are little men. We don't know the ins and outs of the matter. There are wheels within wheels, etc. It would be presumptuous of us to interfere with the designs of fate or even of kings. All right. So, you know, again, this is, I, I believe they're still debating what to do with this letter. Um, and he's pointing, Gildan, I think it's Gildenstern. Let me get that right. Yeah, Gildenstern's pointing out that we're small people. We have no reason to question God or kings. Uh, we just do what we're told at this point. And so he's basically hinting, we should just go ahead and deliver the letter. This isn't our business. We're not going to meddle in things that aren't for us to do. We've been given a task. We agreed to the task. We're going to carry out the task. The results of the task are not on us at that point. Um, he points out kind of, kind of some cool theories on death here. He's like, you know, we don't know what it is. It's illogical. And he's right. That's a very Socrates statement. It's illogical to fear death when you don't know what it's going to be. Now, of course, there's a lot of holes in that theory. There's a lot of things. It's like when you when you were a little kid or even now maybe, you're given a food you've never had before. And if it looks or smells weird, you've never had it. It might be delicious, but we can only go on those impulses that like, you know, I don't I don't know about this. I mean, you know, uh, if you're a little kid, you know, certain color food, like green stuff or whatever, you just weren't going to eat it. And it might taste terrific. Um, my mom refuses to try sushi, no matter how many times I bring it to her and tell her, hey, this is great stuff. You'll love it. It's cooked. Don't worry about that. Refuses to touch the stuff. And she's missing out. So when he points out it's illogical of us to fear something when we don't know what it is. But that's the funny thing here, again, is the paradox. It's illogical, but we all do it. Uh, you know, we all fear death because not, and for him to say it's illogical for us to do it because we don't know what happens. That's the very reason we fear it. Uh, Hamlet even comments on that in the play Hamlet, you know, he says what prevents us from killing ourselves and escaping the pains of the world is that we don't know what's coming next. So, you know, the lack of knowing is what causes the fear a lot of the time. So, uh, you know, Gildenstern's kind of hitting on another paradox that we see frequently when we get to philosophy. All right. Okay, guys, I think we go a little further. Um, they're debating with the, 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 letter here. I think they decide they're going to go ahead and deliver, obviously. Now, the thing is, is as they're having this conversation, Hamlet sneaks up and listens to it. Um, it says, the position, this is Rosencrantz speaking, he says, the position as I see it, then we, Rosencrantz and Gildenstern, from our young days brought up with him, Hamlet, awakened by a man standing on a saddle or summoned and arrive, are instructed to glean what afflicts him and draw him on to pleasures, such as a play, which unfortunately, as it turns out, is abandoned in some confusion, owing to certain nuances outside our appreciation, which among other causes results in, among other effects, a high, not to say a homicidal excitement in Hamlet, whom we in consequence are escorting for his own good to England. Good. We're on top of it now. So he's basically summing up everything that's happened and where they are. And that's all uh, from the play, Hamlet. All right. But I told you to read the stage directions. I told you that was important. 
Since Hamlet blows out the lantern, the stage goes pitch black. The black resolves itself to moonlight by which Hamlet approaches the sleeping Rosencrantz and Guildenstern. He extracts the letter and takes it behind his umbrella. The light of his lantern shines through the fabric. Hamlet emerges again with the letter and replaces it and retires, blowing out his lantern. So we know what Hamlet's done here. He's replaced the letter with a forgery that's going to say, instead of executing Hamlet, that he's there to execute Rosencrantz and Guildenstern. So now we know that the letter they have now that they thought said one thing actually says something else. All right. Um, so the, then the we'll stop. This is a good stopping part because it, that's happening at night. And then the next thing we're going to see is the sun come up and we're going to get more interaction with the player. And this is where some more discussion of death that's pretty deep comes up. But that's a lot to discuss and it shouldn't be tacked on this video. So we're going to stop here. Um, my plan is to go ahead and shoot the next video, but it may be tomorrow before I get it out and up to you because to upload videos is taking forever right now. So I'm going to go ahead and give you this first half. You can answer some of the questions with it, and then hopefully the second one will be up pretty early Monday before you guys get to it. Uh, but I can't promise that, all right? So it'll be done by Monday afternoon, though. I can guarantee that. All right. Thank you guys again, and thank you to, and I don't mind saying the person's name, thank you, Anne, for emailing me and telling me that you really needed to have these videos. Um, I enjoy making them. I miss having interaction, um, but my classes have gotten to be more and more where it's just me talking and people kind of absorbing. I wish it was more discussion-based, but, you know, we'll get there. Um, you know, I, I, we'll figure out how to get there again. Um, but thank you guys for listening. Thank you for paying attention. I know 30 minutes is kind of a stretch, but hey, if you were in class with me, it'd be 50. So, you know, I saved you 20 minutes. All right. So have a great uh, afternoon, evening, morning, whenever you're watching this. And thank you guys again uh, for taking your time and taking this serious and finishing up this last week of, of your time in school strong. I really appreciate it. All right. Okay, guys, uh, I'm going to stop here. going to get ready for the next video.